Well, good morning. Today we're beginning a new series dealing with the issue of pain and suffering. And honestly, unless we're giving you the secret to finally overcoming and getting rid of all pain and suffering, it's a topic that most of us would probably prefer to avoid. But we can't avoid it because it's everywhere around us. It's absolutely necessary that we come to a biblical perspective on this issue of pain and suffering in the world and in our lives. And so as we begin, I want to make you two promises. Promise number one, you and I will suffer in this world. I can't promise you that this is going to be a great year for you. I can't promise you that you're going to perform well in school or that you're going to prosper financially. I can't promise you that this year you're going to be perfectly healthy or that you're going to rise to the top in all of your endeavors. Oh, there are plenty of people who will make those promises to you, but I'm not going to because I don't like to lie, especially when I'm preaching. The reality is this, no matter how much money you have, no matter how well educated or talented you are, no matter how well socially connected you are, or how hard you work, or how well you plan, no matter how much faith you have, no matter how much you pray, no matter how well you walk closely with Jesus, in this life, you and I will suffer. And nobody gets left out. The taxi drivers are right. The rich also cry. No matter what kind of advantages you think you have in this world, in this life, Life is hard. And it's not the same for everybody, but to one degree or another, in one way or another, life will continue to bring to all of us various kinds of pain and hardships and difficulties and challenges that we can't control. And most of them we can't even prevent. Here's the good news. One day, Jesus will come back. And for those who have put their trust in him, he'll lead us into an eternity that no longer has any pain, no more tears, no more sorrow of any kind, no more death. But in the meantime, until then, life has pain and it has suffering and it has lots of tears. That's a promise. But there's a second promise and the promise is this. No matter what kind of suffering comes our way, our lives are always completely in the hands of a God who is fully sovereign, who is infinitely wise, and who is perfectly loving. And He will never fail to meet us, to love us, to carry us, to strengthen us, and if we'll open our hearts to Him, to transform us in the midst of our pain. If we read our Bibles, we know that all of that is true. Yet, we still don't deal with suffering very well because something about it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem right. We know deep down that suffering and pain were not what we were originally created for. And not only that, it just doesn't feel good. Pain is just that. It's painful. So we do all kinds of things to try to prevent the pain or to get rid of the pain. If that doesn't work, we try to do things to dull the pain so that we don't feel it as much. And if that doesn't work, we try to deny the pain, or we try to distract ourselves from acknowledging the pain. Sometimes we get mad at God because He doesn't make everything work out for us. Sometimes we question Him. We say, God, how, how can you love us and at the same time allow us to hurt like this? And some people just walk away from God altogether. They say, if this is how it's going to be, then what's the point of following Him at all? Sometimes we take the blame on ourselves. We think, if, if only I had been more obedient, if only I had more faith, then things would be okay. And other people just keep blindly declaring their victorious doctrine, saying that all of their suffering has been canceled, even though their circumstances prove that reality is otherwise. We're not comfortable with our pain. And not only that, we're not comfortable with the pain of others. So quite often when somebody is suffering, rather than walking with them and helping them by being near and being close and loving them through their pain, we just try to comfort them with a quick dose of theological paracetamol, saying, well, God must have a purpose for this. You know, everything happens for a reason. God's in control. Don't worry. And then we walk away. Or we make ourselves feel better by making promises that we can't keep. We say, don't worry. You're going to be fine. You're going to get better. Or we take it even a step further and we make powerful sounding decrees. We say, in Jesus' name, I declare that you are well. And then we just walk away from them, completely unconcerned with the reality that they are still not well. 
And so instead of actually helping people, we end up becoming these walking, talking Christian bumper stickers, making all kinds of statements that sound good, but they don't help people at all. We say, just let go and let God. You know, when God opens, when God closes a door, He always opens a window. He will turn your tests into testimonies. He'll turn your trials into triumphs. He'll make all of the victims into victors. And yeah, there's some truth in all of those words, but when people are struggling, when people are hurting, when they're overwhelmed with life and confused about all of the things they're facing, they don't need catchy phrases or clever words. They don't need to be made to feel better temporarily by false promises that give them false hope. And though they need to know the truth, they need much more than just a correct, accurate theological explanation of the meaning of suffering in the world. When life happens, and it will continue to happen, people need the comfort and the strength that can only come from the presence of Christ. In the past 20 years, and more, even more so in the past five or six years, there have been so many things in our life, so many times when I knew that God had closed a door. And at the same time, it seemed like he had boarded up all the windows as well. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the pain, God always, without fail, showed himself to be faithful. As hard as those times are, I wouldn't go back and trade them for any amount of perfect circumstances. Because see, it's in the midst of those real life kind of situations when the Father rises up and shows himself to be a real life kind of God. It's in those times when my faith is almost ready to fail that God steps in and proves that he is always faithful and that his love never fails. And as I think about walking with Jesus in the midst of a painful world, there are two particular statements that come to my mind that encourage me and strengthen my soul in a big way. The first one are the words of a missionary by the name of Darlene Dibler. She spent four terrible, painful, difficult years in a Japanese prison camp during World War II. At one point in her imprisonment, she was put in solitary confinement. She was awaiting her execution that they said would certainly come any day. She spent months in that little cell, barely able to even see any light or get any air. She rarely ever saw another person. It was just a prison guard. But this is what she said about those times. That prison cell became my sanctuary. She said they could lock me in this room, but they could not lock my Lord out of this room. Jesus was with me in that cell, and there is no prison where he cannot enter. And then she says this, the presence of God is always a reason for hope. And she could say that because she was experiencing the very real truth of the second statement that strengthens me as I think about suffering. The simple but powerful promise of Jesus, what I call from Matthew 28, the great comfort of the Great Commission, where Jesus says, no matter what, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Nobody knew the depth of that hope better than the Apostle Paul. For an entire lifetime, in the midst of real suffering and real pain and difficulty, Paul experienced real comfort through the very real presence of a very real God. And that comfort changed his life every day. And it compelled him and enabled him to take that same comforting presence of Jesus into the hearts and lives of people all over the world. So today, to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, turn with me in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 3 up to 9. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. When we read 2 Corinthians, we need to understand that this is not Paul, the mighty man of faith, teaching us how to overcome all of the difficult circumstances in our lives. And this is not just Paul, the great theologian, giving us a proper doctrine on how to understand pain and suffering in the Christian life. In 2 Corinthians, more than anywhere else, we see a Paul who is very human someone with whom we can easily identify, someone who lived in the same painful world that you and I are living in, someone who experienced many hardships, who suffered greatly as he walked with Jesus, and someone who in the midst of it all experienced true joy in the presence of Jesus, even when things hurt really badly. Paul was someone who learned that God's strength was made perfect in the midst of our weaknesses. Now, Paul could have chosen here to introduce God in a number of ways. He could have referred to him as the great healer who always takes away our pain. He could have called him the all-powerful miracle worker who always intervenes and solves our problems and makes things right. But he chose to begin with God's heart because if we don't understand God's heart, we will never be able to trust God's ways. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. First, He's the Father of compassion. Now, this is really important for us to understand because if I don't usually really understand what God is up to. His ways are higher than my ways. I don't know why certain things happen. I don't know why He allows life to be so painful sometimes. So at the very foundational level, I need to understand and to know for certain that he cares. And Paul makes it very clear here that God does care. He says he is the father of compassion. He's not the father who feels compassion towards us sometimes. He's the father of compassion. It's his nature. It's who he is. It makes me think of Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus looks out over the multitudes, they were, had been beaten down in so many ways by the difficulty and the pain that comes in this life. Some were sick, some were blind, some were demon-possessed, some were disabled, they were poor, they were hungry, they were abused, they were rejected. And it says that Jesus looked at them and he had compassion on them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And the word that Matthew uses to describe the compassion of Jesus was actually a medical term that was used to describe a pain that's deep in our intestines and a pain that's so unbearable that we have to get relief right away. What he's telling us is that Jesus not only saw their pain, but it became his pain. In other words, he's not just a faraway God who sees our pain and feels sorry for us from a distance, but he is a father who knows his children, who comes near, who enters into our suffering and feels our pain as if it's his own pain. Our English word compassion comes from a Latin word, which means to suffer with, to participate in the suffering of another person. And that's the heart of God, because even when he doesn't take our suffering away, he never fails to enter into our suffering, to walk with us, to love us, to strengthen us, and to give us hope in the midst of it all. A great example of this is found in John chapter 11. Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha were really good friends of Jesus. Jesus loved them. He used to hang out with them and go and visit them. Well, one day Jesus gets a messenger that tells him that his friend Lazarus is really sick, sick enough that Jesus knows he could easily die. So instead of going directly to Lazarus to heal him, which is what you would expect Jesus to do, Jesus intentionally waits two days before he goes. And he knows that means that Lazarus is going to die. Well, after two days, Jesus goes to their home and he finds a crowd of people there who are crying and mourning. Don't miss this. Jesus knows exactly what he's about to do. He knows that in a few minutes, Lazarus will walk out of the tomb alive. He knows that in a few minutes, all of those people who are weeping and mourning will suddenly be filled with joy and they'll be celebrating. 
But the fact that Jesus had a purpose in being there, the fact that he knows exactly what he's going to do, the fact that he knows that this is going to turn out for the glory of God, didn't in any way lessen or diminish the pain that Jesus felt in his heart. The sisters of Lazarus, whom he loved, were heartbroken. Martha comes to him and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. A few minutes later, Mary comes. She falls at his feet crying. She says, Lord, if you had been here, if you had come, my brother wouldn't be dead. Verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping, when he saw the Jews who were with her also weeping, he was deeply moved and he was troubled in his spirit. And two verses later, it says simply, Jesus wept. He wept. Now, there are all kinds of emotions going on in Jesus. He knew that he was going to go to the cross soon. He hated death. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But at the most, most basic level, at this moment, Jesus wept simply because he cared. He was in their suffering with them. He knew that he was going to turn their suffering to joy in just a few moments. Yet in real time, he's the God of today the God who meets us now, the God who works through our suffering, who walks with us in our suffering, loving us and taking our pain into himself as his own. And when the people saw him weeping, they knew that he cared. They said, look at how much he loved him. Our God, Paul says, is the father of compassion. And not only that, he is the God of all comfort. And comfort is not just something that God feels in his heart towards us. Comfort, one writer says, is God's mercy in action. And this word comfort is the key to our passage in, first, in 2 Corinthians 1. Paul uses this word 10 times between verses 3 and 7. So it's good that we have an idea of what Paul's talking about here when he says comfort. Because we tend to think of comfort as ease, something that feels good, like, like sinking into a big comfortable chair at the end of a long day. Or we think of comfort in the sense that all is well, that there are no challenges in our lives, like a businessman who has saved and set aside money for a comfortable retirement. Or a football team who has a comfortable lead in the final minute of the game. We think of comfort as something that's soothing, like putting ointment on a wound or a child who runs to mommy for a hug when he's fallen down and hurt himself. We think about having a comforting thought or receiving comforting news, something that makes us feel better about how things are. But the way that we normally use our English word comfort doesn't do justice to what Paul is trying to communicate here. It certainly does include feelings of being consoled, and often it begins with that, but it's much more than that. Paul's talking about something much deeper, something much stronger, something that's much less about being consoled or soothed, and something that's much more about being strengthened and empowered. The Latin root of our English word comfort comes much closer to what Paul's talking about. The prefix calm means with or together. And then the second part of the word fortis means strong or courageous. It's the, the same root of words like fortify or fortress or fortitude. And then taken together, we get this idea of strengthening with or making strong together. And it's a strength that comes within us. We see that here in verse six where Paul says that this comfort from God produces endurance in the midst of suffering. And the idea of endurance brings to mind the idea of a runner in a race. And the best example I can think of this, this strengthening that in order to help someone endure, is the case of Derek Redmond. He was a British runner who was favored to win a medal in the 400 meters in the 1992 Olympics. But during the race, he injured his leg. He pulled his hamstring and all of his dreams of the Olympics and winning a gold medal were shattered. But he wanted to try to at least finish the race but he was in so much pain. And then his father came out of the crowd and onto the track.
What we saw there is exactly what this word means. The Greek word here means to come alongside and to give help. It's often translated as encouragement or exhortation. It's much more than just helping somebody to feel better. It's a matter of coming alongside someone in the midst of the worst kind of pain and by your presence strengthening them and spurring them on to action. And here in 2 Corinthians, the one who gives that kind of comfort, the one who comes alongside, is God Himself. He's the one. We don't have to run to find Him. He's the Father who comes to find us. That reminds me of 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, where the prophet comes and tells King Asa that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. A God who goes looking for His children so that He can strengthen them. This is the comfort that Paul is talking about. And this comfort is not a thing that God gives us. It's not something that we possess that makes us stronger. The comfort is a person, the very presence of Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. He doesn't tell us where to go and find peace. He Himself is our peace. He doesn't give us a thing called strength. He gives us Himself, and the strength is in Him. There was a theologian in the 1900s by the name of Abraham Kuyper, and this is what he says about this idea of comfort coming in the person of Christ. He says, Christ speaks not of comfort, but of the comforter. Not a thing, not an event or a fact, but a person who by his personal appearance actually comes to comfort us. The Comforter is a person who, when I cannot go to the fountain, nor even see it, He goes for me, and He fills His pitcher, and He puts the refreshing drops to my burning lips. What a beautiful picture of the God who comes to us in our suffering. Five years ago, my wife was going through months and months of medical tests to try to diagnose an illness that often left her completely paralyzed. And at the time, we had no idea what it was. We had no idea what it was going to do to her. They were testing her for all kinds of things. It was possible that she was going to be permanently disabled. It was possible that she was even going to die. At the same time, my oldest daughter was really sick and she was preparing to have surgery to remove her entire colon. They also thought she had another disease, which meant she would probably not live past the age of 30. And then when they prepared her for surgery, the surgeon told us from the initial scan, that they were pretty certain that my daughter had cancer. This was an incredibly difficult season. Sometimes I didn't know how to pray. Sometimes I, I couldn't even think straight. Other times I was just afraid. I was scared of what it is that might be coming in my life. I wondered what the Lord was planning to do in the midst of all of this and through all of this. But He never gave me an explanation. He doesn't have to explain Himself. And He didn't just take it away. He gave me something much better. He gave me Himself. Over and over, when I couldn't get to Him, He came to me. And He didn't just give me the strength to barely hang on. He actually, in the middle of all that, gave me the ability to continue preaching and ministering to others. During those days, I was talking one time with a close friend of mine, and he asked me, Dave, what has the Lord been teaching you through this difficult season? And I said to him, it's really hard to describe with words. In fact, it's impossible. I, I can't explain what's happening to me. But it's so real. It's so deep. It's carrying me. It's changing me. And then I said, I can't really tell you what I'm learning. Because it's not a what. It's Him. The title of this sermon is Finding God in Our Pain. But in those days, I realized more and more that we don't find God in our pain. God comes into our pain and He finds us. He comes alongside. He faithfully seeks us out to heal our hearts, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to enable us to live victorious, Christ-like lives in the midst of it all. Not by taking away the suffering, but by meeting us personally and filling us with Himself in the midst of our suffering. See, the Apostle Paul knew that it wasn't enough for us to just know the doctrine of God's comfort. We needed to experience God's comfort. 
if we're going to be witnesses to the reality of Christ in the midst of a broken world, then we need to see the truth of God's heart wrapped up in the tangible reality of God's presence in the midst of our own brokenness. Paul had walked in the strength of Christ's presence for a lifetime, and he wants us to do the same. The Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. That's who God is. And Paul goes on to say in verse 4 that he's not just that every once in a while, but he says he is the God who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Now, that's a big statement because Paul had a lot of afflictions. Listen, being a servant of God or a great person of faith does not vaccinate you against pain. Paul's life proved that in a big way. In fact, sometimes being a servant of God brings more pain into our lives. And throughout this letter, Paul gives us a whole list of things that were pressing down on him in his life in a really heavy way. Chapter 4, he says that we were afflicted in every possible way. Chapter 7, he says we had no rest from our difficulty. We were afflicted on every side, conflicts on the outside, and fears on the inside. In chapter 6, he gives us another list of all of his hardships, another long list in chapter 11, which includes being in prison many times, being beaten more times than he could count, being stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked, in riots, in every kind of danger, without food, without sleep, exposed out in the cold without warm clothing, and constantly being threatened by both Jews and Gentiles. And in verse 8 of our passage today in chapter 1, he says the affliction at one point was so heavy that we were burdened excessively, far beyond our strength or our ability to endure. He says so that we despaired even of life itself. Paul wants us to know the extent of his suffering so that we will understand the extent of the strength and the comfort that he found in Christ. And how far does that strength and comfort go? Verse 4 says that it's available in the midst of any kind of affliction. That means whether it's the normal difficulties that come with life in this world or the specific opposition that comes because we're walking with Jesus. In other words, if you're a true child of God through Christ and you're suffering in any way, He promises that the strengthening presence of Christ will always find you and meet you there. And verse 5 promises not only that the comfort of God will come in every kind of suffering, but it will go just as far as you need it to go. Just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also, Paul says, our comfort is abundant through Christ. John MacArthur says this about Paul's words here. He says, this is not simply revelation. This is experience. Paul had known tribulation he had known distress. He had known persecution. He had been assaulted by death in life, by fallen angels, the principalities, all of it. And Paul is saying, I've been through it all. And I can tell you, not only from revelation, but from personal experience, that God never ceases to be there. Never. He doesn't promise to take the suffering away. He doesn't promise to improve our circumstances or to solve all of our problems. He promises something better, Himself. And He guarantees that we will find His presence to be more than enough to supply whatever it is that we need, as much as we need it, as often as we need it. That's how Paul sums it all up in chapter 12. Paul apparently had some kind of difficulty and some kind of pain that was so bad that he was literally begging the Lord to take it away from him. But the Lord didn't take it away from him. He simply said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. God wasn't withholding something from Paul by refusing to answer his prayer to remove his difficulty. He was actually making it possible for Paul to receive the real thing. See, he wasn't promising Paul some thing called grace. He wasn't promising Paul to give him some thing called power from outside of him. He was promising the gift of his all-sufficient presence that would continually be at work, strengthening Paul and fully satisfying Paul on the inside. See, most of us know deep down, 
that what I'm saying right there, what Paul experienced, is really the best thing for us. Quite honestly, though, we don't usually want his grace to be sufficient. What we usually want is for him to make us sufficient so that we actually don't need his grace. But no matter how much we want it to be that way, life will keep happening. Life will keep reminding us that we can't depend on ourselves. Life will keep proving that I can't find life for myself, that I can't find hope for myself, that I can't find peace for myself. And God uses suffering to remind us of that. You see, when things are good, when everything is going so smoothly, we don't think a lot about what God is doing. We often don't even think about our need for God because nobody struggles to understand their success. Nobody ever comes to me and says, Pastor Dave, how could a loving God allow me to be so healthy? If God is really good and all-powerful, then why do I have so much pleasure? Pastor Dave, how could God allow my life to be so easy? <laughs> of course nobody says that. But when suffering comes, it brings us back to reality. Paul tells us in verses 8 to 9 that suffering leads us to recognize that we are beyond our ability to find life for ourselves. Suffering beats the pride and the self-sufficiency out of us, and it causes us to put our trust in God, the only one who can bring us hope, the only place where real life can be found. And real life is exactly what God wants for us. He wants so much more for us than to give us temporary solutions to our temporary problems. He wants to give us the fullness of himself, of his life, of his love. And some, so, sometimes we're so busy trying to find a solution to our pain, trying to stir up faith in order to get rid of our pain, and we miss the real presence of Christ who came to meet us in the midst of our pain. It's His presence itself that is our comfort. It's Him being there with us, the person of Jesus through the presence of the Holy Spirit that strengthens our hearts and allows us to have hope and joy and peace in the midst of the worst kind of trials. Romans 8, he says, we're more than conquerors, not by removing these things, but in the midst of of these things. Psalm 23, God doesn't prepare a feast for us after he gets rid of our enemies, but the psalmist says he does it in the presence of my enemies. Psalm 46, he says that even if everything that's solid, like mountains, crumble all around me, there's hope. Not because God's going to rebuild it all, but because he says there's a river that is in the dwelling places of God and makes them glad. And why? Because God himself is in the midst of that river. We don't find God in our pain. God comes into our pain and finds us. He plants himself right in the midst of the difficulty and he walks with us, healing, encouraging, strengthening, enabling us to be everything that he created us to be. And though this is another sermon of its own, I need to just mention as we close that his comfort is not an end in itself. Paul says in verse 4 that when God comforts us in all of our afflictions, the result is that we then have both the ability and the calling to offer the same comfort to others. As we walk closely and intentionally with people, they get to see the reality of Jesus walking closely and intentionally with us. As we experience the strength and the comfort of his loving presence, then we get to take the strength and comfort of his loving presence into a world that desperately needs it. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. That's a promise.